Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to Inside the Firm. This is your co-host, Lance Psycho, and I am filling in again for Alex as far as the intro goes. As you know from episode 145, Alex was at the International Builder Show in Las Vegas conducting a series of amazing interviews with industry leaders. This is part two of that series, but before we get into those, a few words from our sponsors. This episode of Inside the Farm is brought to you by ArcCat. ArcCat.com is the place to go when the time has come for your firm to begin gathering product and material information for its next project. Let's say you're tasked with finding the top window manufacturers, and they need to have CAD, BIM, and specifications. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a search engine that showed you the data you need? There is, and it's ArcCat.com, the number one most used website for finding building product information. Search for a product or even a CSI section and get a list of manufacturers and the data they offer. Even better, you can download all of that technical data for free. You don't even have to register to use RCAT. Save your firm time, money, and frustration and go to RCAT.com to start building better content today. That's A-R-C-A-T.com. And last, but certainly not least, visit Dell.com forward slash inside the firm and select the technology you need to fuel your business. You can also call the Dell team at 1-800-757-8442. That's 1-800-757-8442. And your Dell tech advisor will assist in placing your order and applying your Inside the Firm member discount. Just tell them you're with us. Tell them, tell them Inside the Firm sent you. And don't forget about their partner outreach program that allows Inside the Firm listeners to get complimentary on-site tech consultations from Dell's account executives. We've used Dell for over 10 years at F9, and we can't be more happy. So you can learn more about the program at dell.com forward slash outreach. Enjoy the show. All right, I'm here with Brian uh, from Quadlock. We're still at the ICF convention, and Quadlock is an ICF system. Uh, what is an ICF system? Certainly, an ICF is an insulating concrete form system. So it's a stay-in-place form system made out of expanded polystyrene that forms concrete walls, floors, roofs, any part of your structural building that needs to be insulated and resilient. So we know each other because we work on different projects together. Um, I don't know if we, you've seen the mountain house that we're doing, but it's, it's kind of stalled or else we'd bring okay. in, right? Um, but what was unique about your product is that it wasn't just the walls, and maybe it is you guys are the only ones that do it. You also do the flooring too. Certainly. So, so talk a little bit uh, about that and how that works together, how that connects, and, and what the actual system is. What is this that we're looking at? Certainly. So this is our quad deck system, also out there in the world as insul deck, and it is a insulating concrete form system for floors and roofs. It is a cast in place, stay in place form that creates a concrete joist that allows us to have a suspended concrete floor that has the feel of a slab on grade concrete floor while still being suspended in the air. So you get away from that loud, bouncy wood floor that you're used to. Also gives us the ability to have garage parking over living space due to the structural capabilities of it. What what kind of spans can you do with this? For interior, we're looking at up to about 40 feet for a residential floor, for a garage floor, so parking over living space or over a crawl space, we can get up to about 30 foot clear span and park a vehicle on it. Yeah, so uh, I bet a lot of listeners know if they're familiar with the insulated concrete forms. It's just basically a, a CMU, but it's styrofoam. Certainly. Uh, in, instead, and you fill the concrete inside of it and you make the wall out of it. <clears throat> this floor system, and correct me if I'm wrong, it gets delivered, you basically place it on there and you just pour concrete over it. It's that simple, probably Certainly. some rebar. 
definitely rebar. Yeah, that's yep. an important part of the puzzle there. <laughs> uh, but it is. It's made to order, made to length, and made to thickness. So depending on the spans we're going and the loads that are on it will dictate how thick it needs to be or how tall that joist that we're forming needs to be. And then also, you're going to send us your plans. We do a road map, as you've seen on some yep. past projects, of where to put each piece. It comes off the truck and right on the shoring. So there's very little to no job site modification of the system, and it goes fast when it goes up. Each panel's two foot wide. So if you're setting 30 foot panels, you and I could pick one up one hand right now and set 60 feet of floor form in as long as it takes us to go up the ladder, basically. Yeah. So explain kind of um, the wall layout of a traditional build versus how it would go with an ICF build. Certainly, so the, the construction of the, uh, of the building is showing up on site, assembling our form system. We're gonna be placing our rebar in it while we're assembling the forms. We have a bracing system to keep those walls plumb, straight, square, and level. Place the concrete in the forms. The bracing system is gonna remain in place for a couple days while those walls cure. And as soon as those braces come off, you're ready to come in and cut your electrical in, your plumbing in wherever you need it, and then straight to finishes, drywall, window installation, and dry-in time. So to simplify it, you're setting it up, you're stabilizing it. Certainly. And then you're pouring in the concrete. Yes. How does that compare to if you're building a, a basement wall in a, the traditional manner. Certainly, we're cutting out a lot of subcontractor trades there by getting everything done in one step. So in a conventional basement application, you're gonna have aluminum forms delivered, for example. They're gonna be oiled, they're gonna be set, the rebar is gonna be placed in them, place the concrete in, obviously they're gonna need to be braced as well. Then you're gonna have guys that are gonna need to come back, strip those forms off, rack them back on a truck, they leave. A subcontractor comes in and back frames. Another subcontractor comes in and insulates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And each one of those subcontractors is an opportunity for delay, an yep. opportunity for challenges, problems, et cetera. So we're getting that all done in one step. And then even if you're above grade on the outside, you're putting a moisture barrier. Certainly. Barrier. And But on this, you're not. All in one step. Yep. How, how do you attach, what can you attach to the outside? There, and, and we haven't found anything we can't attach to it yet, so that's the beauty of it. Uh, inside every insulating concrete form system, ours and all the others included, is high-density polyethylene form ties that are spaced on varying intervals depending on the system. But that gives you your attachment point. So whether you're attaching your drywall, whether you're attaching your lath for stucco, whatever it may be, there's attachment points in our system, for example, every 12 inches on center, vertically and horizontally. But I don't have to put any uh, plywood or OSB. If I have hardy board siding, I can either do a rain screen or in a smaller application, just apply it directly, find those points. Certainly. And like, that's it, right? Yep, ready to go. Yep. How about on the inside? What do I do now that it's, yeah, I basically have my wall. The next step is electrical or plumbing. Certainly, we're gonna come in, our, our tool of choice is a, a chainsaw, an electric you know, cordless chainsaw. Come in and we're just creating a groove wide enough for your Romex to get stuffed in. Uh, you're gonna use a tool like a hot knife, kind of looks like a soldering iron of sorts, yeah. to cut in your electrical boxes or your bigger areas for plumbing. Uh, after you pass your electrical inspection, you can fill those right back in with spray foam and up goes the drywall. That's awesome, I've seen the uh, chainsaws that have a little wheel on it. Yes. You know, yep. it looks, because then you'll, It'll be set perfectly so you won't cut into the concrete or Correct. anything Correct. Yeah, like it creates that. a depth stop. Yep, yep. Exactly. 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 So it makes it easy for you. Cool. What other kind of products do you have? So we are a expanded polystyrene manufacturer. So everything foam is our wheelhouse and what we do. Uh, everything from your under slab insulation uh, to keep your, your slab on grade nice and warm. We do geofoam that roadways are built on, marine, marine flotation for docks. Uh, we also have a metal insulated panel here that is similar to a SIP panel, uh, but not a structural application, so more of a exterior cladding for steel buildings, interior coolers, things like that. So yeah. just like our quad deck system, made to order, made to length, it shows up on your job site, you knock it together with the tongue and groove and you're done. That's awesome. If someone's considering using this product, what would you say, what should they think about, how should they think about it, what are the benefits that Quadlock provides? Certainly, you know, the important thing to think of when you're building a home or any type of structure is the energy efficiency and the long-term cost of that building. 
a lot of people are very f- focused on the first cost, the cost of construction, but they're not considering the maintenance, the upkeep, and the utilities of that building over the many, many, many years that they're going to occupy it. Whereas when they go car shopping, one of the first things you're looking at is the fuel efficiency. You know, you, people wouldn't be lining up to buy a Prius if it got 10 miles to the gallon. But when it comes to a home, they're a little more focused on the cabinets and countertops than the energy efficiency. So when you're looking at a home, obviously we still want to build you a home that you're going to absolutely love the aesthetics of, but also look at the long-term energy efficiency and also the maintenance and upkeep costs to the building. A, a concrete building can't burn. It, termites can't get into concrete. There's lots of great things that will contribute to a low cost of ownership in the total time that you own that building. Were you in Phoenix for the ICF conference? Maybe it was last year when I went. Okay. Um, I met most of them, so there's a good chance I was there. Maybe maybe I didn't know you at this time. Uh, Maybe it was two years ago. But anyways, we were in a hotel that was built in ICF. Certainly. And, uh, you know, some guy from some company gave, you know, his benefits, and he goes, oh, and it only costs, you know, uh, 2% more, 3% more. Right. Right. And then the owner of the of the hotel was next he goes first i want to say that that is bullshit (laughs) yeah he goes it costs more than that he goes but there's a caveat i did the math and he's like i paid five hundred thousand dollars more on this five-story you know kind of deal right i can't remember the numbers he goes but then i looked at my energy bills he goes i'm gonna get that paid back in three years he's like i will take that deal anytime exactly so that's where you kind of have to look at it I, i feel yeah, you have to be a big picture thinker. Uh, you know, a lot of the people we deal with, I would say, are people who are, are looking at the bigger picture in life than than the short-sighted, I'm going to buy this house and hopefully yep. I'm upgrading in four years. You know, you move into a house, I don't know about you, I don't like moving. Right. Once I'm in, I want to be in there for the long yep. haul. So that little bit of increased upfront cost pays itself back very, very quickly. That conference also ruined me also because we went and we toured different ICF houses. Certainly. And one of the builders that only he switched from traditional lumber to, to only building ICFs. And it's because his customers said, we love how quiet it is and how peaceful it is in here. Yes. And was, and then I got home and you know I'm sitting down and I can hear the neighbor's dog. I'm like, I want an ICF house. I, well, don't. I know a guy who can help you out with that. Yeah, truth be told, I, I may know a guy who could help get you an ICF house. Oh, I you thought know? you were going to say get rid of the dog. Well, there's multiple <laughs> paths to the end here, but I think you'd be happier in the ICF house, you know, because yeah. someone will always get a dog next to you. They will. They yeah, will. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so uh, how can people get a hold uh, of, of Quadlock? Where should they go to start this process? Certainly. The best place to go is right on the good old web and quadlock.com, Q-U-A-D-L-O-C-K.com. All right. Thanks, Brian. You bet. Thanks for coming. I am here at Site One Services with Danielle. And uh, we're going to talk about their unique product. So what are you guys doing here and what are you showing everyone at IBS? Well, thank you for coming over to our booth. It's nice to meet you. So basically, when builders come to our booth, the first thing that we ask them is, how do you currently receive work order requests? Emails. Emails, phone calls, irate, you know, homeowners. So Texts. Text various ways <laughs> that all require a paper trail eventually because it's not coming in through a unified system. Right. So what we have, the Site One platform, is something that builders and developers can uh, give their homeowners a login to during orientation, and in our portal, the homeowner can log in. They will find um, all of their homeowner manuals copies of their warranties and we also have the ability we also have um, uh, how-to videos for basic maintenance and a maintenance reminder list so that people know I need to change my water filter at this time and that that is awesome so I'm looking at a a, a login and is this an example of what I would see as a builder or what uh, a customer might see as a a homeowner so this is our homeowner uh, login so you will see, okay, there is my address. I own that lot. I click, here are the manuals. Right. We have warranties, maintenance guide. And then could you click on that maintenance video? Now, is it, are these videos you make up or I make up? No, we make these. Perfect. And so, this is just two, we have a whole bunch. Awesome. How to change a smoke detector. How, how to, to change the batteries in your smoke detector. Um, how to unclog your garbage disposal if a spoon accidentally ah. gets down there. Um, 
we have we have various videos, little how-to videos that'll just help a new homeowner. Awesome, very helpful. Um, okay, could we go back outside the videos? I think there's that X button to the right. Or perfect. Now I'm seeing a dashboard with. On the left, it looks like a bar, uh, and I'm just going to read some of it. Punch list, request service, work orders. Okay, awesome. This is looking great. So this is actually the portal that the builder will see when they log in. So ah. in the morning, the builder's administrator will log in and be able to see if they have requests for service. They can look right here. We have a new request at Calrosa. Yep. So we click on it. This is something that the homeowner sent overnight, and it looks like they have a crack in their drywall that, that they want us to come out and take a look at. So they snapped a picture with their phone and attached it so that we could see what it looks like. And then we say, oh, yep, we need to fix that. Let's send it to, this is a general oh, repair okay. that we need to send to one of our subs. And without any additional paperwork we can go ahead and we just right. send that request to so, our sub so in this demo i just sent it to the my drywall guy yep and he probably got an email or a text so all of your subs will also have a login but it does generate an email as well okay so they know yes so they know got so it. they know that they have a, a an order from then, the builder generally in your experience is the sub then contacting and scheduling what time works with the client. Yes, and all of that happens within the portal. So the sub can call, said, yep, I see, I can do this. Yeah. And then they contact the homeowner through the portal and say, what time is good for you? They schedule the appointment. The homeowner accepts. They go to the appointment. After the appointment, they check a box that says, this has been resolved. And then it goes back to the homeowner to say, do you agree that this has been resolved? And if the homeowner says yes, great, it's done and everything's been documented electronically. Perfect. If the homeowner says, no, I'm not happy with it, it goes back to the builder to review one more time. Yep, yep. And then for scheduling, is there is it just an email scheduler or is there a calendar app or um, do they just reach out via... Con do you get what I'm asking? I do. Courtney, what is the best way to explain that? We don't have a calendar app, but it does schedule and they will get a reminder. Perfect. Oh, that's great too. Yes. Um, yeah, because sometimes it's, a, you know, it could be a couple weeks out. It could. Yeah. Um, so when did this company get started? So actually, um, we've been around for about 20 years. Our owner, Mike Gioso, started out in the business as a contractor. Yeah. And when he was uh, just out of college, he was working for a builder. And it was his job to organize the work mm -hmm. orders. And when he got there, all of the work orders were on post-it notes on a wall and clipboards, and it was hard to make heads or tails and how to organize them. Yeah. So that got him thinking, there has to be a better way. And so he reached out to some developers and uh, to some computer programmers and gave him his idea and said, I want to create this. And they said, okay. So over the last 20 years, we have been doing incremental updates. We are now at 4.0. Um, and this portal actually is one that we are really happy with. We're very excited about. It looks nice. It looks very clean. I know people can't see it, but I'm telling you, it, it looks straightforward, easy to navigate. Um, so that's great. And one other thing that's even better is the portal is actually mobile friendly. So we just announced on Monday the fact that you can actually access the portal on a tablet. So if you were going to do a walkthrough or a new home orientation and you have punch list items that you need to go through, yep. you can do it on your tablet. Click, click, click. If something's wrong, you can actually submit a work order from your tablet that will be recorded in here. Perfect. And the homeowner can actually sign off on it on the tablet and you're done. Does it have to be a tablet or can it be a phone? Or it is can it be a phone. No, it, it can, can be, be a phone. phone. If you turn your phone landscape horizontal, yep. You can, you can definitely use your phone. Tablet's just a little bit easier to see. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, anything else you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, so we do have a couple of really wonderful customer success stories that we would like to share. Yeah. One of them is Eden Bridge Homes. And when they came to us, they did not have a process in place. And they were excited to implement 
Site 1. And um, what they found is they actually were able to reduce their annual warranty expenses by 35%. Yeah. Just being able to know and predict you know, what maintenance, based, what re work requests they were going to have based on um, the new homes that were being introduced. They knew to ramp up or ramp down, you know, their labor and right. were able to manage their costs. Yeah, that's great. And for a lot of you listeners, you've followed our development over the last couple of years. Um, and this is another insight that we are learning the hard way is that if you're doing anything of multiple units, it's... It's going to take dedicated time and effort. And if you can get ahead of it, implement some sort of system like this beforehand, um, you're going to save yourself a lot of headache and apparently save yourself money too. So that's good. Yes, absolutely. Um, another great example is we had a builder from Reno come and talk with us yesterday. Yeah. And he was saying, you know, we have a lot of requests that come in over the winter that we just can't fix. You can't fix stucco in the middle of winter. Right. So we have to wait till the spring. Our system will automatically notify them in March, April, so that you know, oh yeah, I have that. And you don't have to go back and follow a paper trail. Yeah, try to Everything find that email from four months ago. Exactly. Yeah. Or find that note you made in your calendar. Gotcha. If, if someone is interested, what's the best way to get a, a hold of you or start this process? So you can go to our website, siteoneservices.com, and we have a, uh, a, a form that you can fill out, or you can reach us directly at 925-678-3260 or sales at siteoneservices.com. Perfect. Anything else? I don't Any, think Anything so. else you want to say to the listeners? You can say anything you want. And uh, if you're here at the show, come and see us. Gotcha. We're in the South Hall upstairs in booth number 1325. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here with Lindsay Fox of Tiver Built. Is that how you say it? Tiver? <laughs> Tiver like Diver. <laughs> Tiver like Diver. Yeah, it's not uh, Tiver like River. By, before we get into what you do, uh, how many conferences have you gone to? Have you gone to this conference before, the IBS? I have IB not. IBS. IB yeah, S. IBS. Yep. No. <clears throat> First time. How many conferences do you go to a year? Or how many have you gone to in the past three years? Um, I don't have a plan typically and it's more opportunistic. Um, so we've gone to Autodesk University twice and we've gone to co-construct their co-con yeah. conference, which is a construction man management software that we use spar AEC next, which what? is laser scanning focused. Yep. And that was uh, just talking to a buddy who's in the industry, and he's like, if you're really wanting to get into laser scanning, this is where you need to be. So no plan, just sort of suggestions. Okay. So then <laughs> I had a question lined up, but it might, uh, do you have a plan when you come to attack a conference this big? Because you've been to the AIA or Autodesk, and mm -hmm. that was big. And I knew that this was going to be even bigger. Did you kind of map out what you wanted to do to tackle this? Uh, primarily, I focus on education, <laughs> trying to see the uh, lineup of classes that they're offering and are they relevant to what I'm trying to do professionally because there isn't a very clean path to the industry that I'm trying to be in. So these conferences provide you an opportunity to get kind of custom, custom tailored education in a very specific field. Yeah. Did you find anything here that you were uh, not expecting? Did I find anything here that I was not expecting? Or that stood out that you're like, oh, that was... Yes. Good. The uh, advanced building and framing techniques, they're having demos throughout the day, all three days. And it's, it's so interesting how they're pushing to use less lumber for more structurally sound buildings and to watch them put these walls together with the explanation of why their methods then in there and you get to ask questions it's incredible because it is kind of a big step to think my building is going to be more structurally sound if i use less lumber and it will have less heat loss that's awesome 
I thought so. Yeah, yeah. Um, how? What's your overall opinion of this conference compared to the couple other that you've been to? Um, a lot. There's just a lot of uh, vendors, um, dealers that you get to meet and greet uh, p- people that you can stay in touch with when you're designing or constructing. If you have issues uh, along the way, call call up that buddy that you met at the booth and hey i'm having a problem <laughs> they're very helpful it's great that is great so you mentioned that you like the education because you're trying to weave a path into this sort of thing that you're creating um what is that can you explain what you're trying to go for uh we i wanted to develop a on-demand uh, construction technology um, service business. What I noticed was that a lot of the technology that exists in large scale commercial isn't populating into the residential space quickly. And a lot of it is just the scale of the companies that are running residential projects. They're building and they don't have time to reach and study and really, there's a lot of options out there and to try and hone in on what the best workflow is that will yield benefit, faster production, uh, better margins. It's really cumbersome. So we've done that. We're creating an ideal construction technology company that can be called in to a design build firm, for example, and says, well, don't study all this, we've got this. So it's a specialty contract type of an environment, only it's allocated to pre-construction versus active construction. Yeah. So um, are you making any headwinds into that arena? How's it all going? Um, Absolutely. And it's been awesome coming to the build specific conferences, especially for the residential space. Uh, and, And just bringing awareness that construction technology is available. Yep. And the design build firms are uh, scooping us up very quickly, and we're able to work remotely with them. Uh, literally sat down, these guys sat down at a table with us with their pulled pork sandwiches, and I asked them what they were doing here, and they're like, ah, oh, we're looking for an edge. And you're like, I got <laughs> like, one for you. I'm, I'm like, I love hearing that. Yes, yep. excellent. I'm like, I'm looking for someone that wants 3D an edge. technology. <laughs> yeah. So I got that and we spent 15 minutes and the questions that they had were so great and they were so excited about the possibility because what we do is create the 3D digital model. It's a digital replica of what they will be building. So they're able to test and strategize in a digital environment so that when they're in the field, they can really focus on quality control and getting the structure built. Yep. Um, what, what is your day to day and start off with, if you have a morning routine? (laughs) Um, I think I gave you this question, uh, for another (laughs) interview. Um, I'm usually up at five and I lift heavy weights. Nice. And my joke is, um, the world is heavy, better train for it. Oh, cool. Do you have that on a (laughs) saying and do you look at it? Um, Uh, like on printed on the wall? I have have too many sayings that keep me going every day. Um, and then I'm home, uh, hanging with the kids and there's this great machine out there called hydro, which is kind of like a Peloton, but for rowers. So I jump on that and then I take my oldest to school, get back in time to meet the youngest so that they can get on the bus. And then I'm off to work, usually tackling some project that, you know, falls in my lap the moment I get in and then really strategizing how to bring awareness to what we're doing and how powerful it can be in streamlining and creating a really good product. Awesome. Um, Do you have any pet peeves or does anything push your button? (laughs) Does anyone repeatedly do it that you want to call out on the podcast? (laughs) Have you already had your rant about uh, sustainability? No, (laughs) I have not. The rant about sustainability is that you can build a house that has like great uh, efficiencies 
and then in the same conversation they can talk about how they can open entire walls and have their heating system heat the outside so that and they don't have to have coats <laughs> and move move uh <coughs> 300 million dollars worth of, of material <laughs> and it's still a sustainable site it's very sustainable yeah the earth didn't mind that at all nope <laughs> um pet peeves is uh getting to hear people in the industry <clears throat> who know about construction technology only talking to themselves or in a very um insular environment so when you go to the conferences and everyone in the conference is there because they have this shared vision or ideal or some understanding of the value that construction technology can add to active construction. And they're all it's all they're all so excited. But I'm like, I'm if I'm just a homeowner, I don't know any of this stuff exists. Right. So maybe we have to stop just talking to each other in the industry and actually speak and say, hey, this is a thing that's happening and get some excitement outside of those bubbles. Yeah. I do find though, when trying to get a client, um, not only do you have to understand where they're coming from, what they want, uh, then you, the next step normally in, in a sales meeting for me is laying out the process of what would happen. And that's going through just drawings. And by the time those two things happen, you're easily at an hour or maybe even longer. And then I, in the process, I do transition to some of the uh, benefits, the edge that, that we give. We're a build firm. Um, we model like it gets built. We have takeoff, stuff like that. But oh, like you're talking about, just some of the things we've seen here, to, to go into explaining that too, maybe should happen more along the whole process mm -hmm. rather than in the beginning. But there's a lot. There's a lot of information out there that that I just did the sales meeting right before I went. I'm like, man, I'm, I can only tell you like a tenth. Mm -hmm. uh, I can only brush over a tenth of what we're going to go through in this process. And the feedback I've gotten uh, in building this company is clients doesn't, don't necessarily want to get into the weeds with you on your process. They want to have assurance that they're going to get a great product yep. that at a good value. And that's about it. You know, they just... At some point, they just pull the trigger and they're like, I don't, I don't need to know that. Yeah, you need to know that, not me. Yeah, well, my personal thought on that is that when you get into something that is significant as building a structure, it is very important to understand what the process is behind that structure. And there's comfortable ways to um, learn that. That it doesn't necessarily have to be like a seminar. Right. You can make it fun. Um, I've seen lots of uh, really great builders have some really nice videos on their websites that yep. clients can understand like why they're why they're different. She has appointments yes. later. Did you know that? I did. Okay. <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> the joy of interviews at conferences. Yeah. Um, yes. So I'm. I'm very much trying to put the process out to them, yep. but in a more digestible and consumable way that they can get excited about. Yep. And if you can, th everyone that I've spoken to in regards to starting a project, the fear that they speak of in regards to, um, is the builder going to do it right? Am I, is this design going to turn out the way I wanted it to turn out? Mm -hmm. There's so much fear that's leading up that they ramp up to kind of protect themselves and I'm like it's okay yeah it'll be fun my slogan is that i love construction you know it's so much room for activities it's this moment if you've ever watched step brothers where dale doback and brendan huff bunk their beds and the, the room gets bigger and they dance in it I'm like that is what construction is and it's awesome to be able to have that experience so I'm going to give you a little education about what our process is so that you can feel confident that you can dance around in your in your space like a 12 year old. Yeah, I love that. Um, if you could go back 15 year years, what advice would you give to yourself? <clears throat> um, 15 years. I mean, I'd have to go back farther than that. 20 years. <laughs> I did want to go to uh, through the interior design program out of high school and I was talked out of it because the perception was an interior design needed to sell a specific aesthetic 
and that you weren't necessarily, um, and this was true when I went back to school for interior design, is that you're the designer and it is your job to push your aesthetic. That because sounds crazy. your aesthetic is your calling card. I find it happens in architecture too. It does. That was the first thing that when we went up to NDSU, they said, we don't teach a certain style. We teach the fundamentals. We teach this. And then I love that. And, and I always say at our firm, uh, Jason knows, it's not about style. It's about substance. Um, so you are right. It's just I grew up in the, the other side of the ecosystem. Well, and that was a unique... That's a unique platform compared to most architectural programs. Is that true? or? Uh, I would say yes, but I, I haven't gone through them all, so I don't want to broad brush all of mm-hmm. them. Um, but I, I wouldn't know, but that's, that is a perception and that's the feeling. A yeah, lot that of the you, have to have a, you're, you have a signature look that you're yep. driving. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright had a aesthetic. Yeah, Nick he, Renard only does Florida <laughs> mansions. <laughs> I have not met Rick and, for, Renard yet, yeah. <laughs> but I like his last name because it's Fox in French. Oh, nice. Yes. Perfect. Um, I'm glad I didn't go into interior design out of high school or even in my college years because I would have conformed to the existing delivery systems and what I've been able to do going through the building experience as a homeowner, complete novice, had a few projects under my belt, but they were smaller. Um, but starting a company with the homeowner's perspective in the forefront Mm -hmm. and wanting to make the experience a really positive one because I do love construction and I do want people to do it and I do want it to be a thoughtful process um, means that I don't necessarily have to conform to the way design and construction had gone previously. Right. So now I'm really tweaking how how a project gets started yeah so i do love that whole story but i don't think you actually answered the question i didn't <laughs> okay um what would i tell myself 15 Tw- 15 20 years ago what advice <clears throat> um just keep learning is that I, I every space that you get into just find a way to extract some some nugget of information. I think that's good advice. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last question. What's the best Christmas present you've either, either given <laughs> or received? Um, my th- the one, best one I've ever given was that my husband is obsessed with chocolate peanut butter ice cream from Ben and Jerry's that you could only get at the shops. He's a smart man. And Obviously. well, because it's rare to find a chocolate peanut butter ice cream that has a chocolate ice cream base. That's Most all of it's I get. vanilla yeah. with the swirl of chocolate and peanut butter in it. Right. Well, he was the store closed, the Ben and Jerry store closed that was in our little village. And so for Christmas, my buddy and his wife were driving to Saratoga and there was a Ben and Jerry shop and I gave him a cooler and I ordered um six half gallons and they <laughs> brought it back and i gave it to him for his christmas present i was so excited he was like he ate one just one at like half gallon in a sitting I'm like there you go yeah. get into that and then he was cycling at the time and i also got him a stationary stand for his butt cycle so yep. he could cycle i'm like all right well you just ate your ice cream now here's the other it part of it <laughs> so that was one of my favorite christmas gifts that i had given um I actually got myself my laser scanner for my Christmas present. Oh, nice. Yeah. My husband and I are like, yeah, let's, let's do this. Yeah. Yes. That's very cool. Um, anything you want to leave the audience with or how to uh, get in uh, touch with you or just to look at your firm? Uh, yes, we are Tiver, T-I-V-E-R, which is Revit spelled backwards because we're totally geeked out to yeah. uh, the power of Revit. Um, <clears throat> Tiverbuilt.com. And... Yeah, just really start researching what construction technology and where it's going and understand the process behind your your build and really take ownership of it and find really great uh, professionals that, that feel your vibe. Awesome. Yes. Thanks a lot, Lindsay. All right. Thank you. We are finally back in the office uh, from a 
Wonderful three days at the International Building Show. I was there with Jason. Jason is now, uh, you no, know here's my first question. What was your overall impressions of the whole conference? The whole conference, um, it was in a lot of ways just big. Like just everywhere you went, it was just a lot of people. There was a lot of things going on. You know, like you kind of have a picture in your head of what a convention is going to be like. And this was just it to like its fullest scale. <laughs> right uh available and or possible and so um yeah there's a lot of stuff happening in the industry even a lot more outside of what we typically do you know a lot of the stuff that they show is um products and and things that we don't spec as frequently you know finishes kitchens bathrooms that kind of stuff yeah um and so it was really cool to get a glimpse into all that because we don't regularly do research on some of those things um so it was cool to get like a broader scope of what people are doing in our industry. Uh, it was really fun to be there sort of as architects. I don't feel like there were nearly as many architects there. So I think I heard like one in 20. One guy said, I don't think you were there with me, but I asked him, he's like, I think one in, he's like about one in 20 of you are. Yeah. So, which is higher than I thought. It is actually higher than I would have thought too. Um, but you know, it doesn't say on your badges what your occupation is. And even if it did, ours said press. So yeah. (laughs) Yep. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, yeah, they had a lot to offer as far as, um, classes and, uh, you know, like I said, there was a ton of floor space available. <clears throat> so we were even talking afterwards, like we need more people next year. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And we'll kind of go over that so. in the future. Um, but you actually went to a class that we haven't talked about yet. So what was that class? Yeah. So and fill me in because I have mm-hmm. no idea. So this one is, was um, from this guy named Mark Hodges. Uh, he used to be a really big production home builder. And uh, now he consults for other people. And he is really good at figuring out how to build things faster and more efficiently without like increasing, you know, like, you know, obviously it would be easier to be like, oh, build a house fire, double your crew. Like it's, it's not that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and so he was he was really good. Like he was really on it. He's like, Oh boy, I only have an hour. How am I going to tell you guys all this in an hour? Um, but yeah, he was really personable. Um, and it was great. And so he went over a couple different, um, factors that were both, some of them were internal, like what you can do within your own business. And some of them are what you can do in your relationships with your trade suppliers, you know, material suppliers, like all that kind of stuff. Um, and so some of the internal ones was, it, it's funny because they're all going to sound fairly simple and easy and doable, but he's like, if you actually do them, then you get results. So they're like, make realistic master schedules because a lot of people will be like, oh, well, I've, I'm putting out this five month, you know, master schedule for this house. And he goes, oh, you can build them in five months. He's like, no, it usually takes seven months. He's like, why are you sending out a five month schedule? You know, yeah. like if you send that to all your subcontractors and things, then things start cascading then they're going to not care about the schedule anymore and suddenly you don't have your subs complying with what your your schedule that you're trying to do and then you know everything's a domino effect um and then some of the other major points that you talked about was uneven flow of starts which relates a little more to production home building where people will start homes based on their sales and so they might get six homes sold one week and start six homes and then the next week it's only two instead of three and three or two for three weeks you know like starting at a consistent pace like that like three a week instead of three weeks instead of six two four one you know it's just all over the place and so yeah just managing the flow of starting your projects internally and then therefore externally um Starting homes before selections are complete is one of the things that will slow you down. So, you know, he says that's interesting because selections seem like, Hey, that can come later. I can start framing. Right. And, um, that's what a lot of builders do. And he was talking about, um, if you try to get them, he said, if you explain it well enough and the reasoning behind it is to get these things on schedule, it creates a mindset with the buyers 
that gets them on board because they're capable of making these decisions early. But if you say, oh, we'll do that down the road, it's like people are always out of town. People always say they're going to be available, but suddenly it's like, oh, I'm not available until this date. And so then suddenly you're having to put a hold on things during the building process because you're waiting for specific selections. And so just trying to get that all done out of the way mm-hmm. before you break ground, just say, this is how we do it. And he said, like 90% of clients are more than understanding. And if you just lay out the process and you communicate it well enough, yeah. they can totally be on board of it. There's certainly going to be people that are like, ah, decisions. I don't know how to, you know, make all these right at once. It's overwhelming all that. Um, he said that definitely does happen. And he said, you know, you can work with them and it might come down to that. It's just not a good fit or whatnot, but you know, mm-hmm. try not to compromise on that too much. And then related to that, the next point is late changes to buyer selections. So mm-hmm. you're already building, they've made their decisions, but they're like, Oh, you know, our closet's so dark. We really do want a window there, you know, just like, please, can you make it happen before it closes? Or please, we want to, you know, adjust this thing. Um, that's, you know, that one is also just in that realm of just like that will slow stuff down. And, um, apparently what some buyers do or sorry, builders do is they will say no late changes, but they'll also have a late change fee. Oh, (laughs) so what the buyer hears is, okay, you can, but it just costs you money. And Mm -hmm. what he was saying is, well, you can, but you just have to figure out how to get the talk, the builder out of charging you for it. Wow. You know, because yeah. they'll, they'll come back and be like, I don't want to have to pay another $500 for a change fee. Like, it's just a small thing. Can you just do it? Yeah. Um, and so really just the changes are are big delays all across the board um, because it just, it relates to scheduling. I mean, as you know, in the field, everything's a domino effect. Yes. You know, you get a trade that's supposed to come on a Tuesday. And if you haven't communicated well with them, then they're like, oh, well, sorry, we can't actually come Tuesday. We can come Thursday, though. And so then you call the people after them and be like, okay, well, now it's going to be available Friday or Monday. And they say, well, we can get to it on Wednesday. And then suddenly you have mm-hmm. these empty days. And he talked a lot about empty house days. Uh, he sort of, I don't know if he coined that term or not, but it's uh, one of the things that he really promotes is tracking your empty days, empty house days for a build because... Um, he said, typically a house will sit empty a day to a day and a half, you know, if you're a, maybe a larger home producer, uh, production contractor. And he said, you know, over a six month build, that's like two months of your house just sitting empty. And so you know, a day, a day and a half every week, every or? week. Okay. So, you know, that, that might not be the case for everybody. It depends on like their, yep. your workload and how good you are at scheduling subs and that sort of stuff. But every day your house is sitting there empty, not having anything done on it is just money out of your pocket. And he was saying from calculations that he's done across the board with different companies, it's often like $500 a day. It ends it up is. costing you yep. to I, have a house sit empty yep. per house. Yes. And so, um, you know, if you can reduce your empty days, you're, you know, essentially increasing your profits or, you know, maintaining your profits maybe instead of it just creeping out of hand. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just gets done faster and things are a lot smoother. So empty house days, not a good thing. Yeah. I thought you were maybe going is plan in flex days. Oh, you know, you you normally do a Gantt chart and there's no wiggle room and then it just automatically gets put back. Like, does anyone ever put in like, okay, after let's say you schedule out foundations all the way to framing you put three days of you know flex day and now we'll start putting on the siding or whatever is next. Yeah, whatever did he, it is did he talk about that or no no i i bet you he would say why are you planning for empty house days you know like i know <laughs> i know why would you be planning for that his this you know this guy mark his sort of whole philosophy was making things consistent and clear so that your trades can be on board because if you know your if your project is all over the place and is you know you're known for being late or things not being clean or you know whatever it is and it's a monday morning and the subcontractor is trying to decide where to send his crews he's going to send it to the one that makes him money and that is easy to work with and so if you can try and be that person mm-hmm. that is 
you know, clear with their scheduling and clear with their expectations and they just know they're going to get consistent work and it's a good relationship, um, you can really reduce your empty days because you're getting the better crews and you're getting them more consistently. Yep. Um, and so his last point on like internal stuff was failure to manage schedule compliance. So that's, you know, a lot of what I was just talking about with, you know, making sure you actually adhere to it, making sure that you're, um, you know, if you have like a sales team, like you have a, uh, a sales office that has like your finished selections and stuff. And then you have the contractor and like all your different moving parts. If they're all on the same page, as far as like what the expectations are for building, you know, no late changes, uh, you know, being able to sort of give a clear message across the board. Th he's like, things just go so much more smoothly. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot about like oiling up your company so that it's just operating like a professional company and not piecemealed or, you know, getting crazy out of hand as construction often does. Yep. Did anyone ask or did he address like, what if the sub just doesn't show up or, you know, uh, I don't specifically remember anybody asking that. Um, uh, I can hear him saying, why would you work for that sub? But it obviously happens. Yep. Um, or know, it's like, the first time you're doing it. Or yeah. it's the first time you're doing it and you don't have reliable relationships set up with subs yet. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what you'd say to that. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone specifically asked that, but it's just, yeah, it's, I don't know. Then, yep. they're, then they're bad. I get an X next to their name. I'm not sure. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. But um, yeah, and then just working with your, so when working with trades, um, he said one of the things when you're like getting bids and that sort of stuff, making sure they actually have capacity and uh, availability f to work on your project before awarding the bid. Um, and, and you know, if you can try to get a glimpse of what their performance is like, uh, specifying how many people you need, you know, like in, in the contract, uh, just say like you know you're going to send three guys right and just like having that written out so that if they send two you can say hey that's not what we agreed to um but he said that one of the big issues with subcontractors is getting subs of subs you know they'll there's a labor shortage and we heard a lot about that at different classes throughout the convention but uh trades will take on work that they know they don't have the capacity for but they're last resort is oh well i can always sub it out if i have to mm -hmm. but then you don't know then these people don't necessarily know your project as well you're getting you know potentially less familiar labor which will be probably less skilled you know we had that with our painters it was just there were always new people coming in and they weren't subbing out but you know they always had new people coming in the right. door Right. And so in our project, like it started with an original like four and then it got down to original two plus two to four random people. And they, it was like new people almost every week, you know, or was, more than that. Or it more was, than that. It was, yeah. yeah, it was, you know, just a, a revolving door. And, you know, that ultimately doesn't lead to as good of a finished product. Right. Um, and then uh, he, he also left a little tidbit in relation to that was... Um, he, he was adamant about broom cleaning your job site every day and having the subs broom clean what they were doing. So he said one of the tricks that he would do with subcontractors <clears throat> is he'd walk up to them and be like, oh, you guys are doing a great job. And he's like, where's your broom? And they'd be like, our, our broom? It's like, yeah, do you have one? And like, oh, no, we didn't bring one. It's like, how are you going to clean up after yourself? You know, just like asking them where their broom is and sort of setting that expectation that that's a tool that they should have with them to clean up after themselves at the end of the day. And it's not like ridiculous, you know, like not make it sparkling clean, but yep. you know, just broom clean. Yep. Broom clean every day. Yeah. So that was one of his big things. Cause I mean, we ran into that a lot where subcontractors would leave stuff messy and we had people dedicated to cleaning it. But if they didn't get there yet and another sub was trying to work in there, they're like, I can't work in these conditions and they yeah. try to walk. And I love this because a lot of it is validation, either of experiences that we've had or that Nick Renard had, um, or I just thought about, but like when, when I make new subcontractors agreements, like one of the things I wanted to put at the top of the list is you will clean. Well, one is every Monday at 8 a.m. If you are on site during that whole week, you will come to that meeting. Right. Number two is 
you will clean up after yourself. And and now I'm gonna say broom clean every day. And it also reinforces so that I know I'm not being an a hole or being ridiculous. Like no no. Yeah, we talked this about is, this. We were on the same page about this when we signed the contract. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then I like the number of people too because I saw the the framing crew, which I really like. It like it started. It was like eight people. Then it got down to three quickly, and I'm like, man, I feel like there should be eight people out right, here. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it's, you know, this is stuff that people all across the industry are seeing. You know, it's not, this this guy worked for, I forget what the name of the company was. He tried to keep it secret, but he accidentally said it, and I wrote it down somewhere. But it, it's like Toll Brothers level, like they built thousands of yep. homes. He used to work in major production housing, and so he spent a long time studying this kind of stuff. And his biggest note for, like, working with trade partners and capacity, um, and he made a he was like big bold letters on this he's like pay them on time mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that was just a big thing it's just like you know that's what it comes down to is people will do what's good for their business and so if you pay them on time you can help build that relationship and they'll want to do more for you because you're consistent yeah so that was a big one um but yeah that was you know a really quick overview i mean like i said this guy talked for like an hour on this kind of stuff and it was Super fascinating. Um, and he had a really good PowerPoint that we should be getting in the next couple of weeks. Gave him our card. So awesome. We'll hopefully be getting that. But yeah. Cool. That cool. Was, that was awesome, fun stuff. Um, did you go to another one or was that the main? I did. I mean, yeah. So there were there was another one I went to. Um, this next one was a, a panel. It was called uh, A, D, and C financing from a builder's yeah. perspective. Um, and a lot of the finance stuff went a little bit over my head. Yeah. <laughs> because it took me partway through to realize that A, D, and C are different types of loans that you can get. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so. Uh, do you know what they all stand for? I do not. Okay. I yeah. was hoping you do because I don't. <laughs> no, I don't know. No, I think, I mean, I think they're, I think that's literally just like what they are. So like people were talking about like, oh, well for this kind of project, I was trying to get a D3 loan. And it's just like, I think that's just the naming of types of loans. And it's just one of those structures out there that, um, you is know, more is, nuanced is than normal. More people. nuanced. Yeah. has to do, you know, like bankers and all yeah. those people like the actual financial departments of these bigger places know all about this stuff. But, um, so, you know, they were just talking, it was, you know, like I said, more of an unguided panel and there were a couple builders and uh, accountants up there answering people's questions about stuff. So it wasn't so much like a walkthrough on like things you should or shouldn't do. Um, one of the guys was a home builder in Denver, which was oh, nice. interesting to hear about. Um, his company builds um, net zero ready homes for low income people. And so I was really interested in that at first because I was like, how on earth is he managing to get that level of building, which typically is very expensive yeah. in a expensive market to people that can barely afford it. Right. And so I talked you, to him. You can barely build a regular house for affordable. It's right. like, it's extremely, it's extremely, extremely hard. hard. And so, you know, I, he was talking about ways of, just trying or just that their their company tried to be like efficient in systems that they chose and like their design that kind of stuff and uh i was like man that's like a lot of what we do and you know at the same time like it would be a big premium to a client if we suggested doing that zero ready and so i talked to him after i was like how are you doing this in a denver market and he's like oh well stapleton has a, a program for that and um so he's like even if it's not in stapleton you know, we talk about the gap, the gap between code building housing and energy ready, you know, efficient or net zero ready housing. Yeah. And the, it's a government program that helps pay the gap so that people can afford houses that are actually really expensive. So I was like, oh, well, that's a lot less exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I was, I was really hoping that they had somehow cracked some sort of code on yep. um, figuring out how to do this stuff a lot more efficiently. Yeah. The was, floors are paper mache or yeah, something. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever it was. And I was, you know, about to ask like what all the low hanging fruit was and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, like everyone does this. Right. And like you, if you just don't paint your walls, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Or, you know, you just dumpster dive for everything and then you get your lead points and, you know, local yeah. resource and whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, not exactly what I was expecting, but, um, they're, 
their hers ratings that they were getting her you know hers is the yep you know what it is but it's they were getting 22 and lower for these low-income housing stuff which was pretty cool yes um and then he said he also got a glimpse into the 2021 ibc and irc codes and uh he was saying this was sort of a tangent to the whole panel but this was the stuff that i better picked up on but he was saying that uh the after you know if, if it goes into effect as currently written if it's adopted as currently written it will pretty much make like energy star and these other like higher rating things obsolete because they'll be so you know net zero ready essentially uh just by code that you know it's not really worth going more right or at least much more yeah and so um that would be a really big change to our industry you know so it, it'll be interesting to see and you know that's probably not a couple years out for a lot of cities but as you know longmont in 2018 at the end of 2018 adopted the 2018 codes already right and so you know there are some townships out there that are like right on it adopting the newest stuff as soon as it's ready to come out and so and i can't remember but at least last year i know some point in last year there was a town that was in 2006 Erie's still in 2006. So there you go. <laughs> so there's some towns that this might not happen for a long time, but yeah. it could also be Erie will finally update and they're like, we're going to go straight to 2021. You know? Right. And that would be a really big change. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure what the code would dictate as far as like what systems you're supposed to use or if it's like an offset with solar panels or if it will be a big change to building structures. Yep. Um, but It'll be curious to see all, how all that pans out and when we might get a glimpse at, at these codes. But that was just an interesting, like, you know, here's a little vision down the, down the pipeline. Yep. So, um, but yeah, there, there wasn't like too much consistency in that, you know, coming back to the, the panel. Um, the other builders were in like Portland, um, or one of them was, and... Some people were asking like, oh, do people, you know, like change, like buy lots and then change zoning and, um, you know, people were like, yeah, it can be done. It just depends on the municipality. And I mean, I believe we did that with our project. It was with this one with this one. Yeah. That we're no, in. we, we kept it in. We just semi broke a tiny rule and they allowed oh, it. Oh, I see. Um, and you know, that just affects what type of, you know, like loans you're trying to get because, uh, you know, I think what you guys did for this Mark II development is you bought the land and then got financing rather than using the financing to buy land. Correct. Um, and so there's different forms of those finances out there where you can get the land. And I think you, sometimes you have to have a better like relationship with your bank. Like you have to find a bank that you really are, are do well with um, so that they know what kind of product you're giving. And mm -hmm. so when you're trying to get uh, a loan for buying a piece of land and then putting a house on it uh, that they can do that. And I almost imagine that would be harder in areas like out here where it takes a long time from buying land to being able to develop something because the planning process, especially if you have site plan review is just long. I mean, yeah, two years easily yeah, for some be, projects. It so. can, especially the bigger ones. If yeah. you're doing a bigger development, it can be a two year process. Yeah. Which is probably one where you get financing for the land rather than just holding the land yeah. in your own pocket for a couple of years. It depends. Yeah. Lots of different options. But, um, so, uh, I think I just, just speaking for us, but if you're planning to go to this conference, the next one is in, uh, Orlando next year in February 9th and 11th to the 11th the um, international builder show yep it's in oh. orlando um so didn't, if, didn't the guy at the intro talk about how we they had committed to being in vegas for the next 13 years but he said from 2024 oh, from 2024 to, yeah or whatever it was yep then they're gonna Got be in it. vegas for the next 14 years oh, but he okay. said so like it's in orlando yeah interesting yeah that's fun and i think our strategy um if we go and if we execute this strategy it's so big yeah that I would like to have, um, well, first, I think you should go knowing what you want to get out of it. Yes. Right. So for us, we were kind of looking for construction software, uh, but we kind of had that idea. Maybe the last part of the first day, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. oh, we should go check this out. Yeah. It was, I was, you know, yeah, definitely have a, like a set plan for things that you want to 
accomplish because the floors are so big it's hard to visit everything and so if you're able to sort of filter through and find what you want but also leave some flexibility obviously for if you come across something be like that looks cool i'm gonna go talk to them and then i would after you're done visiting take notes if it's something that's on your list and even notes of i didn't like that because because you might be comparing one software to another software to another software and be like wait why didn't i like that first one or you know what was going on there so Make sure you take notes. So our plan would be if we are going to go back in time is I'd bring Jason and someone else, Sam. And Jason would start at one end of the conference the first day and just start going through every booth, but knowing what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Sam would be the guy going to all the classes that day. And then I would be doing all the interviews. The next day it would switch. So Sam would pick up where Jason took off, start going through it all. Jason would go to all the classrooms. I'd still be doing all the interviews. Now, a bunch of you probably aren't doing interviews, so you could do a two, you know, just a two pair kind of system like that. Um, I because, well, did you see every? I know I didn't see everything because the second day I did more of the interviews single handedly. I I did not see everything. I mean, I I walked into every hall. I can say that much. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, there was the North Hall, which I remember walking into and being like, there's some cool stuff here. We'll have to come back to this. And we never got back to it. And, and isn't there, remember when we saw the opening ceremonies mm-hmm. and like that building, wasn't there more in that building that we never even went back to? Oh, I don't even know what building that was. So, But remember we Probably. had to cross the street and get kicked Oh, at- yeah. yeah. I, I feel like that was the North building. No, because no? the the North building where... Um, I came and got lunch. Like oh, I went. Oh yeah, yeah. It was still farther. There was another building another that we building. never even went back to. Yeah, um, it was a big show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the opening ceremonies. Um, that <sighs> self promotion. Self promotion. A lot of the way, and you know, it was kind of like a sh- like sort of a show. I mean, they literally had dancers to begin with. Interpretive dancers. Interpretive dancers to a. It was a kind of cool like um, digital background. So like the dance movements were integrated into a a set sort of yeah. set visuals, and so. And I don't know if we were anxious to get going or if more people were relaxed. A lot of people showed up, but I uh, we left. Yeah. Um, and I won't put this on you because I was like, let's get out of here. <laughs> no, I was kind of feeling the same at that point just because they were going through like, you know, make sure you have fun in Vegas, but like, don't get too drunk and you yeah. know, make sure you still do these things. But it wasn't, you know, that's stuff people know. And it wasn't as informative as I was hoping maybe an opening ceremony was going to be. Yeah. Um, it was, it was Alex Rodriguez was the yeah, and we speaker, didn't even stay. We didn't even get to that point because yep. we were like, well, we've got <laughs> more, more pressing things to do. Well, one, we needed to get registered, which maybe those other people were. Yeah. Um, and then two, we didn't know that it didn't open until a certain point because we just walked through a crowd and walked in. And they let us in because we were press and other people tried to get in. They're like, no, you can't get in yet. And, and we're, we're like, like oh, sh- oh, that's how we got in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were wondering why there were so many people outside the hall. We're like, why is there such just a traffic walk. jam? Just like the doors are open. Just, just go. And, yeah. And then we were like, oh, it's because we got our special badges. Yeah. So I could see if um, you just got there and the doors weren't open and yeah. you wanted to sit there. Um but uh, other than that, I had the same thoughts as you. I thought it was a great conference. I thought mm-hmm. it was huge. I thought there was a lot there. Um, I thought, like, I would have wanted to go to more classes. Like, I think that financial one, well, maybe not that kind of forum if they would have had, like, more of a class on that. Right. I would like. But uh, um, the the one class we went to, the Economic Outlook, was awesome. That you one was a really good one. Yep. Yep. So... Uh, overall, I'd recommend it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our little outside the firm, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, getaway and uh, stay and tuned. What? Go just, ahead. Just one more thing. Uh, another reason that people go, you know, our friend Lindsay that we interviewed earlier, uh, she she's like, she comes, you know, for a lot of it, just the networking. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not even so much about what's at the show, but who's at the show, like who who else is attending at the show, and and you know, with sixty five thousand people attending, there's a couple there's, people. There's there. a couple people to talk to, and yeah. you know, people also looking to do cool things, and so you can make some good relationships that way. Yeah, so, another little plug for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Talk. So we'll talk to you later. Yep. Bye.